This week, I'm joined once again by Jason Josephson Storm to discuss his latest book, Meta Modernism, The Future of Theory. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paid patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you would like to support the podcast and keep it running indefinitely, then please find links in the description below. Enjoy. Jason Josephson Storm, thanks very much for joining us once again on Hermitics Podcast. It's a real pleasure to be here. I had such a blast last time we talked. I'm really psyched to uh, be back on the show. Yeah, it should be fun. should be fun. I mean, it's going to be a pretty eclectic episode. We are discussing your, I believe it's your latest book, I'm assuming, unless you've <laughs> written one in the space of two, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> two months. Yeah. No. Uh, Metamodernism, The Future of Theory, which was published June 2021 this year um, yeah. by University of Chicago Press. Now... I was then saying to you, but you said, I need to say this on air, I need to say this on recording, which I'm happy to do, you know. Um, on a personal note, this is a book which needed and has needed to be written for a long time, uh, especially within, I mean, I'm obviously coming at it from like a continental background. So especially within that field of thought, which is at times very hegemonic. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, last time we were talking about uh, the myth of disenchantment and when that book arrived, I was like, okay, this is a fairly thick book. He'll probably be able to tackle a lot in the in the space of this. But you're a really uh, articulate writer, very dense in a good way, but still uh, uh, quite poetic at times, right? So there's a lot going in. But when this book arrived, I was like, man, this is, this is thinner. This is a smaller book. What's going on? And somehow you've managed to pack in more than the previous, more than the myth of disenchantment in a smaller time. Like every page is like... Uh, a rapid fire of things going on and there's so much going on it's crazy but how can i give an overview of why this is really important uh basically in the title right the future of theory taking theory seriously the understandings of what canonization is really the the sort of the the backbone of what this podcast has been trying to do for a long time, which is attempting to um not so much dismantle but critique in a very uh, affirmative sense, these sort of unspoken regimes which are going on, which none of us really address, but are all yeah. there in canons, in curriculums, in and eventually in sort of your unconscious understanding of what philosophy is generally, right? Um, there's much more going on in it than that. Um, that's sort of an abstract overview. But I mean, would you agree with what I said there is the, is the main line of thought? Yeah, it's an attempt to exactly to work through a particular canon of material and that sometimes gets called postmodern and figure out what was useful, what is worth sort of consolidating and, and building on and what do we what are the blind spots? What are the things that we have um, exactly sort of frozen out or, or omitted or overlooked? And um, and it, and then and, and in terms of your previous comment, it's so dense in part because I, I had less words allowance from the press. Like they they were like, no, you got to keep it to this. I think one hundred and ten thousand words, something like that. And so I was like, oh my gosh, how can I do that in so little pages? And so I know it, it's it's dense. And if people who read it, I mean, I've gotten feedback that people say they need to read some of the chapters multiple times, and they get more out of it if they do that. So for for your listeners, I want to apologize. It isn't it isn't an easy book. I think I tried to write very specifically in a no jargon, no bullshit kind of way, which, and to kind of reject the kind of obscurantist writing that really often um, can take hold or just, you know, specialized jargon that can take hold in any academic discipline. Um, and so I'm trying to not have it be that kind of bullshit. But on the other hand, I am trying to pack in a ton, probably too much. Really, this could have been multiple books, but I'm like an impatient person and I just kept going, you know? So, I mean, I just wanted to kind of put it out there yeah totally okay okay so i mean i, I think a big question is that i imagine this is like years and years of studying certain things and being a specialist in certain things which are a bit occluded from the academy um but can you think of maybe like key moments where you you this this book maybe years and years ago started to take take root and you thought this some this is something that needs to be because as i read it I had this, maybe I'm completely wrong in this, but obviously coming from my last conversation, I had this thought that this is something that's been brewing and growing for a, for a long, long time, which is now like, right, this is slamming out there. Yeah, totally. I mean, I've been thinking about this book in, in certain respects since um, as long as my second book. So, you know, The Myth of Disenchantment we talked about last time came out in 2017, and I started thinking about it in about 
2011. And, and I started thinking about this book I, at that same moment, really. I mean, for a little while, I thought that they were the same book, um, although for weird reasons. But but anyway, they didn't turn out to be the same book at all. Um, but the, like the real moment was, you know, but but more deeply, this kind of came out of my experiences in grad school. So when I went to grad school, I started grad school with this like wide eyed love for trendy continental philosophy. And basically what I was doing, like, you know, I went, I sought out people. Like I went to Derrida's lectures. I went to Richard Rorty's lectures. I went to uh, one lecture of his. Uh, I went to lectures by Cornel West, by, you know, whoever. Uh, I went to Latour, Zizek, all those guys. Um, and mostly they were dudes, unfortunately. But anyway, and I just went, I was just like so in awe of that whole style of thought, of that um, whole um, sort of counter-hegemonic, critical thinking. And, but then as I got deeper and deeper into it, I found pieces of it I loved, but I realized that that particular form of counter-hegemonic philosophical argument had itself become the hegemon and uh, a kind of hegemon that was resolutely negative in a particular way that would um, kind of throw any resistance just into the abyss. Uh, you know, there's a way, there's this famous quote um, from Hegel, which which originally um, was the part of the inspiration for this book, um, something like uh, about skeptics waiting around uh, uh, for the moment to throw thing, the newest thing into the abyss or whatever. And, and I felt like um, I'm a big fan of philosophical forms of skepticism, but a lot of skeptical postmodernism was no longer actually a true skepticism. It wasn't really a question of doubt, but had become a kind of new dogmatism. So it was like, you know, instead of saying, might knowledge be power, it was saying knowledge is power. Or instead of saying, um, might we be deceived in our senses, it was saying, you know, you can't know anything, your senses are all false or whatever. All these are dogmatic claims, not really doubts. And so part of it too was a sense that that wasn't working. And then, you know, on top of all this, there was this intense negative tone. Um, and, and a lot of scholarship was just about showing how fucked up and shitty everything was. Sorry, can I cuss or should I? Yeah, that's that fine, out? that's fine. Yeah, so just, and, and things are pretty terrible and I'm not trying to idealize a world that is in many ways quite dystopian, but what it struck me at uh, already in graduate school was that much of that theory was able to take us to the abyss, but it wasn't able to take us out. Mm -hmm. And so the question became, what kinds of theory might lead us out? And then I read you know, tons of stuff. I mean, I tried, I'm a very eclectic reader. I just love to read outside of, um, you know, any of, of established disciplinary boundaries and, you know, reading stuff that gets flagged as a cult or stuff that gets flagged as new age or a lot of Asian uh, philosophical and religious materials. And, you know, but then also the, the people that my graduate advisors had described as their enemies, namely the positivists and analytic philosophers mm -hmm. and all of these different places, there were things that could be recouped. So, um, that's another way to talk about its origins. The other way to think about it that I, you know, is that it's pretty clear that when we're talking about postmodernism as an academic model, that is to say, not as a time periodization, but as a mode of doing scholarship, that postmodernism was the mode of a generation immediately older than us. And there's a, they, and those, that generation of people are, you know, had, had a lot of wisdom, but things have changed. The world situation is different. The classic works on postmodernism that describe the postmodern moment, let's say Lyotard or uh, Frederick Jameson, uh, no, all of those describe a world of basically the late 70s, early 80s, or at least that's their, their pinnacle of their of descriptive insight. The, for, for better or worse, things have changed in many cases for worse, but, but in, in quite radically different ways. And so that mode of scholarship has had its heyday. And the question becomes, what's going to happen next? And for a while, I was looking for the new thing to jump on and uh, and to join. And and but I kept realizing that many of the groups now positioning themselves as anti postmodern are merely um, repeating postmodern uh, ideas and idioms, uh, but just now transposing them in some different arena or another. So you know, from we went from structures and post structuralism to like assemblages, which are just structures. You know, but they're like the trendy word. You know, even in the same French, even even in the French, even in French, it's the same word structure and assemblage. It's just you know somehow people who would not be caught being a structuralist are happily throwing around assemblage as if that represents something fundamentally different because the metaphor is slightly more fluid or something like that. And, you know, so, um, but, you know, so, so many of it, so I thought what we needed to do was very seriously reckon with postmodern moment, figure out what the real core philosophical problems were, and then figure out which ones to build off of and which ones uh, uh, to move past, which ones do we consolidate, which ones do we repudiate, 
et cetera. And so initially, when I came up with the idea for the project, I was thinking of Hegel and his notion of the dialectic, um, you know, the movement of thought, which is often called the dialectic. And for those of your listeners, I'm sure, you know, people drop Hegel a lot, but, you know, th- what I mean for those of you who aren't familiar with Hegel's notion of the movement of thought, thought is supposed to start in terms of a limited abstraction, a negation, and then a negation of the negation. And what uh, struck me at the very beginning, like the core insight that was like the day I had the idea for this project, was that all the things that we call uh, postmodern are themselves formulations of kinds of negation. So it is postmodern deconstruction, post-colonial, anti-essential, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all of those things suggested to me that Hegel's idea of the negation of the negation might be a way to kind of move past them, not by the old modernist mode, which was to, to just not take them seriously, basically, and just say, oh, that's these crazy postmodernists, but actually to work through them by way of radicalizing them, come out the other side of them. And so that was the original inspiration. The project isn't really built uh, around Hegel more than that key insight. Um, I don't want to, I'm not a Hegelian in a deep sense. I don't think, um, you know, Hegel was wrong about a whole ton of stuff. uh, And, you know, but I think he had some key insights for how thought moves. And that was the the sort of the inspiration there that I then sort of, um, a kind of Hegelian opportunity operation that I ran on postmodern and modernist uh, philosophical movements to try and come out the other side. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there's, there's an immediate question there because I've wanted, to, I've, I've been, I think I, so many people actually, myself included, have been waiting for someone to uh, just, just break postmodernism for a long time. Right. So if you, if you sort of accelerate modernism, you end up with postmodernism. If you accelerate structuralism, you end up with post-structuralism, eventually all these things you they're worked with for so long they end up into something else however postmodernism and as you say these words post and i mean post really just means after but yeah. now it now it doesn't because it isn't we're clearly not after modernism because postmodernism is still like as you say this negation which has like an umbilical cord attached to modernism and is constantly like checking them they're like see we've gone beyond your structures but it's like well okay so why are you still talking about them Right. It's like a friend of mine, John Cusson, said about anti Oedipus. He's like, right, you wanted to destroy Oedipus, but all you've been speaking about for the last 50 pages is Oedipus. Right. Yeah. You have this problem. So, I mean, what happens then, Jason, when you, what happens to postmodernism when you accelerate it? Can it ever break itself? Can it ever truly be critical of itself? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think you're exactly right. The way that the, um, that um, negational movements have a tendency of suspending the very thing that they're trying to eliminate uh, and often preserving it in ways that it might not otherwise. So part of the way that postmodernism preserved uh, modernism was in its very notion of oppositionality, exactly what you're saying. Um, so then the question is, well, how do you get out of that trap? And m- my thought was, we use postmodernism as a starting point, accelerate out of it as a starting point, but the arguments themselves have to stand on their own without reference to the antecedent. So if if I was only criticizing, you know, like the weighting of this book was was a little bit tricky because um, I think one of the biggest sections that I cut was a, a long historicization of postmodernism and a long digression through various post, so-called postmodern thinkers and their predecessors and whatever. And I cut that down into what is still probably too long, but it's a section of the introduction. Um, um, but, I, but, I, but, you know, people were saying, you know, you're just being negative. You're just being negative. When are you going to get to your own positive project? And I needed I realized that they were right in that even in the way that I was framing things in order to have it not be mere antithesis. It can't be merely reference to its enemies. It needs to actually stand on its own terms. And in that respect, for your listeners who are, um, you know, for anyone who's, who's just, you, know, you don't care about postmodernism. Even if you're like, I'm not kept up late at night worrying about postmodernism. I really don't care what these French continental philosophers said. You don't have to care. I think that the book makes arguments on its own, not arguments from authority, not because some famous French dude said it or because, you know, uh, it would be politically expedient to believe X, Y or Z or whatever. But on its own grounds, um, in a bunch in, fi- in areas of five areas of concern, uh, you might say that that might be relevant to people who are, if not um, scholars, at least people trying to think big picture about the current world. And, you know, and questions about, you know, what do we mean when we're talking about things being real or not real? Um, what do we do with the fact that our conceptual categories all seem to fall apart in similar ways? Like, you know, religion, you know, you can't come up with necessary and sufficient conditions to define a chair, much less uh, uh, the category religion or the category art or the category philosophy. Um, 
things like the, the problem of language and how it relates to the world, um, the, th the problem of skepticism itself, what should our orientation be toward knowledge? And then finally, a question about value and where, where does value come from? What do we do in the face of ethical nihilism, et cetera? And so um, I'm gonna look at a little note to myself to make sure I just recap them, but yeah. So basically out of those kind of problems, I kind of end up making arguments to, in, in kind of five different areas. Um, something around the question of realism. I, I argue for something called the process social ontology as a way to address the way that social change happens. Basically, um, I have to, I think a lot about language and, and meaning in the world. Um, and then I have a, a, a stance toward knowledge and then a stance toward ethics, basically. And all of those are kind of bundled together in the book. And in each case, um, you know, this really could have been probably like three books, basically the first chapters, maybe one, uh, the first five chapters maybe stick together. And then the last two are each their own kind of thing, each sort of more promissory, although I think they cling together pretty well. Um, but um, in, in either case, I think if you care about what the world looks like, how society changes, um, how knowledge functions, uh, you know, if you think that the answer to, if you want to think about big picture issues like climate change, like uh, structural racism, like na nationalism, like colonialism, all of those kind of things, we the theoretical apparatus provided to us by both modernist and postmodernist philosophers is going to be insufficient. And I'm going to provide something that I think will, um, while consolidating the best bits of those previous movements, gives us new answers and, and new places to look. So, um, you know, I think it's true that the book, um, it's definitely written at the level of the academy. And I'm imagining uh, uh, an educated readership when I was writing it, basically. But I think um, it has implications for a whole bunch of things outside the, the narrow confines of our ivory tower that I, uh, you know, I'm literally in my office. I'm literally in kind of an ivory tower <laughs> looking out over undergraduates frolicking in the lawn. But uh, anyway, yeah. So um, all that is to say, um, I think it stands on its own. So and the term uh, metamodernism, which I, which I use as the title, was a really late term for me in the book. Um, when I first pre-circulated the manuscript, it was under the title Absolute Disruption, with the same The Future of Theory afterwards. But then people wanted to add an ism to it. And so they said to me, you know, um, oh, is this an example of post postmodernism, or is this just another new materialism because of one chapter, which I get close to new materialism, but reject it. But at that point, I hadn't written the rejection part in as deeply. Um, and, and I was like, no, I mean, post postmodernism that, that phrase makes me want to vomit. And the new materialisms are neither new nor are they materialisms. Uh, for the most part, they're trying to transcend a, a matter-mind dualism. And it's really weird to think of those as materialisms. Um, and so I didn't think that either of those um, was appropriate. And I knew that people were going to add an ism to it. And so there I uh, came across a few people who had used this word uh, metamodernism in a way that I thought made sense to me or, or could work as a characterization of part of what I was trying to do. Um, and then uh, that's, yeah, and so that's what I kind of did with it. I mean, basically, is I took that term um, and building off of and reading their scholarship, but but not in a direct connection with them um, necessarily uh, to call this project that. But it has some limitations. The emphasis is on the meta, really, even more than the modernism. What I'm trying to do is think about how to lift over and up and transcend some of the things that we are um, so invested in, in the academy and in the world at large. Uh, the broader intellectual climate of uh, of the globe at the moment, and um, you know, not that they're always the same things, but there are a lot of flows of knowledge that that circulate the globe for better or worse. And what I want to do is kind of lift up, and part of also that process of lifting up, and this is my training in both sociology and history, is that I wanted to also think about um, the the professional side of it. Why do we? What you know? How do these textbooks come together? Why did they come together the way that they did? How does the structure of the contemporary academy lead us into reinforce certain kinds of positions uh, and not others? And what might we do about that? Um, and so, so the, in that respect, it's it's meta because it's also trying to be self conscious about its own production and about you know I spend a little standpoint time, although not too much, thinking about my own position and coming to the materials and my own vantage on the academy and and, and its. Uh, in its own weird way. And so all that is to say, um, the book is also about looking at a bunch of academic debates from above and looking at the way that um, a bunch of different disciplines that don't really realize that are often repeating the same arguments in very similar 
uh, terms, even if often in different jargon, and 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 coming to similar impasses because their starting assumptions tend to be the same. And so, um, uh, you know, you you get you know ontological turns that mean the opposite things in political theory and in anthropology or, or what have you. They don't necessarily realize that, but it, it, you know, or or you get um, movements where people are basically you know keep rediscovering the body in tons of different disciplines, and then you know thinking that the other people haven't discovered the body, and then you know it just you know that kind of thing. So. Um, so this book is in that respect a grand synthetic project and it's based on about a decade of reading that, that went into it in a bunch of different areas as I was kind of trying to feel my way out or through uh, uh, this kind of stuff. Yeah. Just to, just to jump back, I mean, it's a really interesting question. It's probably something that you've developed out of because I think you sort of said it's where you started as well with these continentals. And yeah. how do you think it is that they've developed a hegemony despite the fact that they uh put themselves forward as the people who are trying to dismantle all these hegemonies but really it seems they've developed the most dangerous form of hegemony because it's the one that sort of says no 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 like we're not we're not right how have they managed to do this which in time has especially in the west of course has sort of for many people conflated the entirety of philosophy with what is a very very limited boxed off for a group of primarily french continental philosophers from the 70s right it's outside and it's getting sort of smaller right i'm thinking deleuze derrida foucault um that group and it and it's slowly not actually it seems from my perspective i would say how do you think they managed to create that hegemony? yeah yeah i mean i think you, you're you actually i think to hit the nail on the head at the very beginning which is that by positioning themselves as, as counter hegemonic is actually precisely how you achieve hegemony. So one of the interesting things that that, that any that any student you know deep student of ideology has probably come to at one time or another is that ideologies are really good at absorbing contradictions. So for example, you know um, colonialism can often frame itself as anti colonialism. Take Japan for example. The Japanese Empire uh, was itself an anti colonial empire. It said we have to colonize Asia to keep Asia safe from colonization, right? Which is which was a, uh, an ironic and tragic uh, internal contradiction. So, um, and, and, but, but, you know, we continue in other ways, like, for example, part of the contemporary fight over, um, you know, free speech is, is precisely being weaponized in order to suppress certain kinds of speech or, or what have you, perhaps. Um, uh, although that's both sides, both sides would disagree about exactly what's being suppressed and what isn't. But, um, all that is to say, things are capable of absorbing their ideological opposite. We have to be aware of that. And so, so, and then second, and so one of the interesting things, you know, let's talk in, in terms of the realms of politics is, for example, the way that a uh, um, conservative in the United States, for example, a conservative, broadly libertarian, uh, anti-government um, groups, like I'm, I'm talking about George W. Bush, for example, managed to uh, achieve uh, uh, much more government control, even in the very moment that they were repudiating government and talking about how they didn't represent government and government, big government was bad. They got I mean, put in place things like the Patriot Act that extended the power of government in significant, in many, many significant ways. So all that is to say, um, we, uh, Across uh, much of the um, contemporary world, uh, especially the contemporary Western world at the moment, um, love to celebrate uh, the rebe rebellious figures. And there's this tendency, you know, everybody sees, I don't know, the Star Wars movies, and they think that they're, we're supposed to identify with the rebels and not with the empire or whatever. And the position of rebellion seems seductive. It seems sexy. Everybody wants to be the rebel badass. Uh, but the thing is that then one of the ironies is that by merely celebrating the act of rebellion, but not focusing on what the act of some kind of consensual uh, a stable government might look like, all we can do is launch these people into positions of, of hegemony uh, based on the way that everything is so screwed up. We, we, we want to reject hegemony. And then we put the counter hegemons in the hegemonic position thinking that they're going to fix things. But all they know how to do is, is rail against a hegemony that they now themselves embody. And so, you know, you, that, that isn't necessarily the right way out. And I think what we need to be uh, is, is able to have much more, let's say, uh, sophisticated conversations about, you know, um, uh, what the what what actually how to how a government could actually work, for example, or you know what its limitations are and what they aren't, or um, you know if you're why we think certain kinds of stances seem sexy and and academics and and I uh, you know include you know I, I love my colleagues, but there's a strong tendency for academics to want to position themselves uh, as radicals 
but in the defense of fairly conventional uh, political forms. And so, you know, uh, take Zizek, for example, who who did some has done some really provocative stuff, but a lot of his stuff and, and some really good stuff. But a lot of his uh, recent stuff turns out to be like, you know, you make a statement that seems like totally absurd and then you use it to justify fairly conventional uh, political position, you know, and so, you know, it, it seems shocking at the first pass, but then what he wants you to actually do with it is something that's pretty conventional. Mm. Um, and, you know, that's not always the case and his early work wasn't necessarily the case, but I think that there's a strong tendency for that as well. So you get these really radical books like um, Bill Connolly's The World of Becoming, which starts with something I'm very sympathetic to, which was a Whiteheadian review of the political sphere. And then it terminates in buy a Prius and recycle. I mean, <laughs> you know, why is that? How, you know, it's, so it's not in that respect profoundly emancip emancipatory. And um, but that energy is being channeled. And, and, and the other reason, and, and I'll continue on, on this front, is that there's been a strong tendency to try and uh, the way that certain kinds of theories became canonized, and I spend a little bit of time talking about this in the book, but um, basically the way that we got a particular set of French dudes uh, uh, became dominant in the Anglosphere is because they got imported via initially literature departments. And that meant that, you know, what happened was American, Anglo-American academic philosophy got super specialized, uh, uh, particularly under the influence of something called logical positivism. It got into trying to do really minute, minute logic chopping. It like thought that like, you know, and, and I remember this alienation, like I loved philosophy courses until the, the first uh, philosophy, uh, upper level undergraduate philosophy you know, Anglo-American philosophy course I took that where, you know, the, the issue debate was supposed to be, is the cat on the mat a true statement in all possible <laughs> worlds or something? We're supposed to get excited about that. And it just seemed like totally disconnected from, from life and everything that I they actually cared about. And that was part of my shift toward continental and Asian philosophical traditions. Well, so philosophy got super specialized. It also tried to turn itself into a quote unquote science. And so uh, the function that it had served in the academy as a whole, which was often to bridge people in different disciplines, to ask questions of knowledge, what is knowledge, to ask questions of value, what is value, ask questions, all these other kinds of deep questions, it no longer could, could fit those purposes. And so Anglo-American scholars looked elsewhere. And because of the premise of things like literary existentialism, they were often drawn to people in lit departments, were often drawn to French thinkers and some Germans uh, and, and maybe Danish people like Kierkegaard or whatever, to try and uh, think about what ways they, what kind of resources they might use for reflexive thought for more broad picture thinking. And uh, it turned out that they, you know, that they then imported people who were uh, uh, a certain group of French thinkers, including Derrida and, and Foucault and company, um, skeptics, uh, who they used to challenge existing disciplinary boundaries. But the solutions uh, often seemed to be at the level of language. And so part of what people took away from it was this uh, easy to caricaturize view that if we can just intervene in language, if we just change the words that we speak, pr produce new terms, produce uh, um, to, to produce uh, new literary novels that celebrate global warming, or you know change the preferred word for one group from X to Y or whatever, will actually solve political problems. And I don't think language reform is bad. I'm a, I'm a big fan of language reform, and I don't you know I'm not trying to in any way uh, um, argue that things were better off with, with older terms. But just to say that that in of itself is insufficient, uh, and and but it often becomes the preferred model uh, among many of the counter hegemonic people when you're when you're asking them, well, what do we do? Okay, okay, you've criticized you know the the metaphysics of presence in Western philosophical thought. What are we supposed to do instead? Or you know Richard Rorty, prime example. You know once you've criticized all of philosophy, what do you want to do next? And then he's like, you know, write poetry basically. But like, I mean, come on. And so what we end up with is a bunch of bad poetry masquerading as theory and trying to solve problems at the level of at that at level of extreme discourse that's mostly going to be read by a small group of people. And so, you know, like other people that I respect, you know, Tim Morton, um, whose book on, you know, uh, hyper objects or whatever. I mean, like, you know, the idea that we could solve climate change if we could just develop, you know, a more poetical attitude toward nature or something. But you know what, that's not, none of those are actually concrete things. And they tend to um, overemphasize individuality and individual choice making. And they tend to overemphasize um, uh, interventions at the, at the linguistic or aesthetic level. And again, linguistics at the individual and aesthetic level are important, but um, they're not sufficient. And because we tend to try and solve problems at the individual level, we keep thinking that, oh, you know, we could solve it if just you or I or the people that we talk to changed our minds about some minor matter or another. Or if we could just identify the really blameworthy people and, and, and call them out or whatever, we could just solve the whole system, for example. And again, 
I, I, I'm not in any way uh, interested in perpetuating bad people in positions of power. But on the other hand, a lot of this individualistic level thinking doesn't actually solve the fundamental issues, which are often structural, massive, and need really kinds of fresh, broad thinking thought to address and practice to, to respond to. And so, um, you know, it's like trying to solve uh, uh, climate change uh, by, you know, uh, individual carbon footprint, which was something actually promoted by British Petroleum or beyond petroleum as they were climbing themselves. They wanted everybody to think that they had their own climate footprint so that they wouldn't get regulated. So, you know, I mean, that that model of, of individualistic answers to big problems and even the very idea that came to dominance in many sectors of the academy, which is that theory is bad. Uh, first, we had theory is good and it's going to solve everything. Then we got the backlash. Theory is bad. And all we need is radical particularism. You can't make any generalizations. You can only do micro studies of micro studies of case studies of micro studies or whatever. That isn't this isn't the solution to any of the big issues that we actually care about either. So this was an attempt to do something broad, to reoccupy the place that uh, that that uh, had you know, to be one, not the only play, a version of reoccupying some of the places that have been held by philosophy in the past uh, and to try and um, you know, to be, be serious and grown up about theory. So this is a theory that I, it, that is willing to, um, you know, it's it's a rebellion. But I think even if it were to come to certain kinds of premacy, it's a theory that has built into it its own fallibility. And so it's not that the idea that that it's gonna that all attempts to produce generalizations are false, or all attempts to produce to govern uh, are necessarily going to be evil and bad, or all attempts to produce norms, or every power relation is often or is evil or something. That's none of that, but it, but it is built into it, and this is, is important to it. Uh, an idea of its own limitations and a sense that we're all. Um, uh, you know, kind of need to advocate for a kind of humility and a kind of humble knowledge that that can be emancipatory without uh, being egotistical and without being, you know, uh, without falling into some of the pitfalls that both uh, certain forms of skepticism and certain forms of anti-skepticism have fallen into in the past. And, and then that last other piece I'll add is that, and then the other thing is like when we got into, when I got into the postmodern stuff, into the continental philosophy stuff, I thought skepticism was emancipatory. I thought, you know, if we could just you know, who, you know, question authority, right? Like that was, you know, but people had that as a, but my dad had that as a bumper sticker. I mean, it sounded pretty cool, you know, and, and I was uh, coming out of a punk rock scene and I was just, you know, that was part of what I wanted to do is question authority. But the thing is, if you actually look at history, it turns out that skepticisms have tended to be depoliticizing, often defenses of status quo power, and have just as much a history on the right as they do on the left, if not more. And so it, it shouldn't be a surprise that, you know, um, I think what I forget the British prime minister, I think it was uh, Balfour, maybe was a was a, a skeptical philosopher who wrote a philosophical defense of skepticism at the same moment as he was beginning to perpetuate what will become the crisis in Palestine. And so, you know, I mean, you can or 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 you can look at how um, when, you know, Montaigne's skepticism is a defense of custom or, or Hume's skepticism is a defense of custom. I mean, a lot of times, um, or, you know, or Kierkegaard's skepticism is a defense of faith or, you know, or Fox News's defense of skepticism in the face is, a, is an attempt to, um, in, my, in my sense, uh, you know, uh, keep a, a certain a, a group of posh people protected, you know, so, you know, get you to doubt climate change and worry about, you know, uh, regulations uh, uh, around the oil industry or whatever. So, all that is to say, we thought skepticism enough was emancipatory, but it turns out that what's emancipatory cannot be that kind of skepticism. A certain kind of skepticism can help us. I'm sorry, I'm monologuing. I realize I just got on a roll. roll. Sorry. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. But I, but I think we just need to be skeptical of skepticism. And that doesn't mean that we uh, assert an absence of doubt. So like one of the group of people that I, I didn't like, and again, uh, I apologize for your international listeners who may or may not share my politics. I, I'm, I'm, I'll tell you my politics, but I, I'm trying not to be too judgmental of people who don't share them. But, you know, it's like when, for example, after the American political election, uh, the, the former uh, Hillary Clinton advisors were trying to like say that the answer to, to quote, quote unquote post-truth was just to slap facts. And they were going to produce these things that called facty memes, basically. They wanted you to have a meme and then you're going to have a little number and you're supposed to zap that number and it was supposed to tell you according to some dubious website whether the claim was a fact or not. That was so naive. That was so embarrassing. That was so horrible. But a lot of colleagues of mine, especially you know, I can see why faced with skepticism around climate change, faced with anti-vaccination skepticism, faced with conspiracy theory, et cetera. A lot of people are trying to like slap what they think of as facts and promote facts. But what they're what they don't recognize 
recognize is that we have to hold on to our knowledge lightly. And, and in fact, overemphasizing the rigidity of any particular factual claim that may, may in fact change is actually how you produce skepticism. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, insisting that, you know, okay, we totally, the, 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 you know, the CDC knows everything and therefore we shouldn't wear masks. And then the CDC says we should wear masks. And then people are like, oh, the CDC, what did, did change? And they become skeptical of the whole thing instead of recognizing that uh, what we even think of as scientific knowledge is constantly in the process of change. Um, or, you know, I mean, and, and that's true on a bunch of fundamental levels. Uh, you know, we might say that, ha that uh, facts tend to have half-lives. And also, you know, uh, another point is that it's often an attachment to certainty that reinforces skepticism. So as I argue in the book, um, the problem, you know, people often blame these days, blame philosophy's failings on René Descartes. Um, but the problem with Descartes was not his doubt but that he wanted to doubt everything about which he could not be certain. It was the idea that there were some things you could be certain about that I think was his real problem. There's not anything that you can really be certain about. Uh, you can always come to doubt even your senses. You can come to doubt the applicability of mathematical truths. You can come to doubt, you know, all, all and sundry, basically. Anything could be subject to doubt. So that that whole notion uh, uh, that, that there is something undoubtable and that Descartes, his whole point was, you know, people only read the first part of the meditations, but his larger philosophical oeuvre, um, was, you know, to, to try and reestablish certain knowledge of the world was what he wanted to do. And he thought, you know, God couldn't be a deceiver and therefore you get the whole world back. And all that. I mean, the doubt was preparatory for Descartes, but the problem was he made a doubt that was too strong because his notion of certainty was all the things he thought were certain could later be doubted. And so, you know, uh, the, the problem is an attachment to certainty. And, and if you lose the attachment to certainty, doubt loses its sting. And then you can also start to doubt certain kinds of doubt. And to describe this doubting doubt or skepticism of skepticism, uh, I turned to uh, an old Stoic uh, uh, maxim or, or alternate term for Stoicism, which was zeteticism. And I don't want to add new jargon more than I need to, but I think when I was calling this earlier, you know, skeptical skepticism, people just thought that was annoying. And then I tried calling, you know, a couple other different things, but, but I think zeteticism at least tends not to have too many presuppositions, but it was inspired by something that um, the uh, Sextus Empiricus, the founder of Stoicism said, which is um, he was criticizing what he called the dogmatic skeptics of a previous era. So he said, first, they're dogmatists who think they know things, and then they're dogmatic skeptics who are certain that they don't know anything and that knowledge is impossible. But then the true skeptic, uh, uh, he or she doesn't know whether we know or not. In other words, one of the things we have to doubt uh, it, once we begin to doubt our own doubt is that we have to let in the possibility of knowledge. So mm -hmm. I could be wrong or I could be right, I guess, to, to quote a uh, uh, public Im image limited song, uh, uh, you know, I could be wrong or I could be right. And I don't know, but uh, we have to keep both in our realm of possibility. And so for that reason, um, if, if you have that kind of attitude, I think it causes a whole bunch of other problems to melt away. So there's one chapter on that for, for readers of the book, the second to last chapter of the book explains the skepticism stuff and the doubt and knowledge stuff in more detail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, this would be quite an abstract question, thinking about this sort of idea of, hegemony, non-hegemony, and like a third idea. And you could think of that as maybe canonization and then just complete fragmentation of like, just read whatever. If, if, if what you see as the future of theory was to be taught as a course, in what sense could there be a curriculum? Could, you know, in what sense can you stop there becoming some form of canonization, which immediately goes from becoming to being and, and then they're done once again? Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. And I think one of the things that I want to say is that the what we need to do is, it's, okay, the problem is not that we formulate canons. The problem is how we formulate canons and how much we invest and attach to them. So I think what we need is a continual shift in canon. We need a canon. It's not, because look, a lot, humans, the the main enterprise of scholarship of the last, I don't know, 3000 years really has been commentaries in one form or another. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. if you look at the medieval scholastics in, in China, in India, in, in, uh, in Europe, um, uh, what will become Europe. I mean, it, it's, it's commentaries. We, we tend to do our thought often in relation to other people. And I think that's in part because we think in intellectual communities we're, the, we're, we're not the isolated solipsistic individual thinker that Descartes fantasized again. Here I am beating up Descartes for something else, but <laughs> and I forget that, uh, but we think in communities and canon and formation, community formation often co-occur. So part of what tends to happen is communities determine their canons. And, and I'm thinking about scripturalization and the formation of scriptural communities, but academic disciplines tend to function the same way. They, they formulate themselves in references to certain kinds of textual sources. The problem is not that, it, that that canons get formed, but when canons get calcified, when they get, they exactly make that transition from being thought of as something that is constantly unfolding, constantly being added to and dropped off, 
and and they become you know regimented into things in which we are we we become fixed in our view of them in which we no longer can can continue to reorient ourselves to them and expand them and contract them so for example in religion departments you know, we have this canon course that we're traditionally supposed to teach in my own college, and it's people like Durkheim and Weber and 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 uh, 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 Mueller and uh, E.B. Tyler. It's a bunch of pretty, uh, of a fairly uh, of old dead dudes of a particular sort. And the thing is, the answer is not to throw them all out and say we no longer need to make thoughts and reference, but rather to figure out a which of those thinkers is still living? In other words, not, not biologically, but in a Benjaminian-ish sense, which of those thinkers is still speaking to us? And what other thinkers do we need to include to do a kind of new speaking to us? We're, we're, so, you know, we should add in. So what I tended to do was, you know, well, I was constrained by the institution. I couldn't totally get rid of as many of them as I wanted to. But I think a small number of those are worth thinking through. I think Weber, for example, I find useful, even though I'm arguing often with Weber. But, you know, I would and Durkheim, probably Durkheim and Weber, I might hold on to or Durkheim and Weber and Freud. And, and then, you know, let, let some other people go by the wayside, but then add into a whole canon of thinkers that have been excluded. So add in, you know, contrast, you know, put your put your. Cornelius Agrippa uh, or something alongside your Spinoza or put your um, put your, you know, see what Crowley is doing with Tyler if you have to t teach Tyler or, you know, or include, um, as I tend to do in a lot of my work, thinkers by uh, from world philosophy, from African philosophy, from uh, East Asian philosophical sources, etc. There's uh, uh, so-called religious and philosophical sources, etc. And to use them to do the thinking, not merely as the objects of thought, but as subjects of thought. So, you know, part of this book, uh, especially below the footnote line, is a big engagement with world philosophy. So in this sense, we need to expand the canon and not attach ourselves to let to individual people falling off the canon. And also, I think, uh, continue with the emphasis on becoming. And, and as you've noted, I think that there can be a rhetorical gesture toward becoming in a lot of places, and there has been. But uh, I think what we, we, we need to put that in, into, into life a little bit more. And, and that means um, allowing things to be revised and to change and to evolve um, in, in our academic world and in our intellectual world, in our world outside the academy uh, as well, because things are changing anyway. And so, you know, uh, I, I get the, 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 so far I've had, mostly quite positive email responses to this book project, uh, mostly from graduate students uh, and people who are postdocs. Um, and I've had one senior scholar who actually works in Western esotericism who said great things about the book, and I'm really delighted. But, but the one big negative pushback I've gotten is from scholars who themselves definable postmodernists, uh, one in particular who basically said to me, there's nothing after Derrida. You don't engage with Derrida in enough detail. And, you know, this whole thing, you know, why are you calling it this, blah, blah, blah. And, and I think that that's an attachment to a certain canonical figure who at a certain point, you know, Derrida had some real insights, but most of his stuff, um, you know, we, we don't need to fossilize him. We don't need a Derrida that is uh, the Saint Derrida, you know, or Saint Foucault even, you know, and part of that too is an artificial reverence for um, certain people as, um, you know, saint, the equivalent of academic saints, you know, like we don't need to, we don't need to pretend that Derrida wasn't a screwed up dude. And we don't need to pretend that Foucault wasn't a screwed up dude. You know, we can recognize that they're flawed, even as we might still find pieces of them that, that speak to us and, and, and others that don't. Um, and so what I'm really trying to do in a certain way is expand the canon and then make the canon self-reflexively self-conscious. And I guess that's the last piece I would add to. Part of, I think that what we can do too is have a canon that talks about itself and that recognizes its own eventual obsolescence. So I try and end this book by saying, you know, I don't think my book is absolute now. Don't jump the gun and throw it out before uh, you've worked through it. I mean, I think that the things that I argue for in the book are are, are probably right. I mean, hopefully uh, some of them are probably wrong, but I don't know which ones. But I think in general, I argue them because I think that they're true. But eventually I end the book by noting that eventually this book itself will need to become obsolete. And so if it's ever canonized uh, in my grand fantasies of egotism that I try and uh, prevent myself from getting too invested in, <laughs> um, if it's ever if it's ever canonized, it will continue to contain the mark that tells future readers that eventually it'll no longer need to be canonized. Uh, but I, but I would I would encourage them not to accelerate out too fast of this one because uh, I think I present a lot of really um, uh, important contributions and insights that uh, I think we will need to build off of before we um, work past hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, but you know we'll see you know and some parts of it may hold better than others and that's the other thing too is recognizing that I may be wrong and I want to be able to change my own thoughts and my own ideas and so part of one of the things that being a zetetic and now that we know this term as a group we can use uh, being a zetetic means is holding lightly to one's own one's own knowledge and recognizing that you know somebody may call me out 
They may find things that I'm wrong about. Uh, I may, I mean, I hope that I'll be wrong about some things because that's growth is to discover, oh, wait, you know, this thing that I thought was the case isn't the case or whatever. And now I've moved on and grown. And I, I remember uh, a few years ago at a very, at a seminar in, I was in Japan, I think, and this very senior scholar came up and somebody asked him a question about his work um, that was kind of a, a challenging his thesis. And he was like, he thought about it for a minute and he goes, like, yeah, you know what? I think I was probably wrong. And that was a profound moment because for, for me as a junior person, because senior people often never do that. You tend to get it, or not never, but rarely do that. You often get an extreme defensiveness where people are like, no, you know, how dare you challenge my, you know, great insight, blah, blah, blah. That's not what we need. What we need is not a skepticism that's so certain of its skepticism, or uh, what's worse, a kind of dogmatism that that can't challenge that can't take any challenges to its orthodoxy, but something that is able to revise, adjust, and expand, um, and and continue to change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, just as a just as a sort of a humorous aside, are there any philosophers who, time and time again, you you do think you see their names come up and you think this this guy, he's please can we stop right you know he needs to go yeah i mean i think I, i'm not a big fan of deleuze i mean i know a lot of people at this exact moment are super trendy into deleuze and i know a bunch uh, a bunch of your, Ooh, of your leadership is no is gonna, is gonna, 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 gonna get pissed off at this i mean i mean i think i i really liked um I, I got some quite a bit out of early Deleuze. Um, I think, for example, his his book on Nietzsche was, although not a very plausible reading of Nietzsche, was really inspiring. Um, I think, for example, that um, that Anti Oedipus was, a, you know, there's some interesting stuff. But a lot of what people do with Deleuze is they take ideas of his which were always intended to be. Um, uh, I, I want to say surrealist and dreamlike, mm. uh, poetic maybe, and then they try and either concretize them in ways that make them either totally implausible or more often they use Deleuzean ideas to avoid addressing serious philosophical issues. So they'll just, you know, you ask them something and they just go deterritorialization as if that answers anything, you know, or something, mm. you know. And again, I, uh, so I, I, for me, and maybe that's just because Deleuze is the last of those guys that's still trendy. He's the one that I'm having the most problem with. I think in, in their own day, you know, I, I have uh, long since shed Lyotard. I, I don't think, you know, uh, uh, you know, we had talked about this a little bit briefly in our email, but I think Lyotard's claim that we would move past meta narratives was just flat out false. I don't think we escaped. Meta I mean, he, he meant a couple different things with that, but but one common reading of that uh, is was is just flat out not true. Um, uh, or you know. Um, you know, I think Derrida's work is of diminishing returns. Uh, the, Really, if I'm honest, the main thinker of that canon that I still think with, uh, my own work is Foucault. I mean, I, I find Foucault, uh, um, I don't agree with Foucault, but I find Foucault someone that I have to grapple with in a, in a, in a really deep and fundamental way. And consistently, I do so throughout this book. Um, but well, well, and I think that there's some evidence for this. If you look at citational trend lines, uh, which I did and, I, and for, for a slightly more empirical part of this book that I cut because it just seemed redundant, um, the, citational, the citation of most of those French theorists has peaked. Deleuze, maybe not, Foucault, maybe not, but the rest of them, the Baudrillard way decline, Derrida is on a downward slope, Lyotard is on a downward slope. Uh, uh, the, there are a whole host of other figures that were more uh, uh, peripheral at the edge of those movements um, who, who you know, um, you know, th there's an attempt to like kind of get the last surviving person who remembered uh, 1968, like I don't know, La Ruelle or whatever, and try and build something philosophical out of them. And I, you know, and I don't, I don't, I haven't engaged with La Ruelle deeply, so maybe there's something there I'm missing, but, but most of that seems uh, ill-fated. And so, um, and on the similar hand, you know, uh, but the, the other thinkers that I, um, yeah. Anyway, we could I could do the same thing with German. Talk about you know who I like and who I don't like in the in the in the critical theory camps too. Um, I don't know. We'll see. That's that's my subjective judgment. Um, but even the ones that I that I'm most dismissive of, let's say Deleuze, uh, had some real insights, and I don't want to deny those. And and the the thing that probably readers of this book will see as the my most Deleuzean is the emphasis on process. And so Deleuze has definitely has at times looks like a, a process ontology.
and I, and, I'll, and especially um, influential later interpreters of Deleuze, uh, like Manuel Delanda, who I find still interesting, more interesting than Deleuze. Um, you know, I I, I, uh, I I still speak to me in and in, in the work, and so you'll see. You know, I, I also don't ever want to do the thing where I dismiss a theorist without reading them. And there's a strong tendency for people criticizing postmodernism to so-called to not even read the thinkers that they're arguing against, or to only mm-hmm. get a couple pages in and then just throw it out, like. Alan Sokol's famous critique where he kind of missed what everybody was doing. And then he was like, oh, it was a bunch of jargon. And then he threw out it. There is a bunch of jargon. And a lot of it is crud. But if you work through the jargon, some of it is uh, a lot of, there are also a bunch of really profound insights there. And so you, you, it's a kind of a question of um, which ones and, and which insights are worth recouping. And so I try and work through, you know, not just the postmodernists, but actually the modernists. Like the, if you think, think of a ton of jargon, analytic philosophy, positivism is full of a lot of jargon. Um, and then, but some of their, but they're real insights there as well. And so again, I want to be able to polemically criticize the folk that I think we need to move past, but without taking them to be enemies. Mm-hmm. And that's also part of returns to the point we were talking about at the beginning, which is that insofar as uh, uh, this is why I don't think what I'm doing is post postmodernism. My idea is not to hold up and spend my book just bashing on, you know, I, you know, write a whole book bashing on thinker X, Y, or Z, Dillas or Derrida or whatever. To do that would be to preserve the work uh, in a way that I, that, that I don't think is necessary, even in an antithetical framing. And it would continue to have that same problem of the way that post-structuralism preserves actually a, a very bad version of structuralism that then it turns into networks, you know? And so, you know, for example, I don't want to do that kind of move or the way that the, you know, new materialism just transposes into ontology, the philosophy of language that had been articulated by previous post-structuralists. Again, that would be a mistake. So, um, so anyway, yeah. So this is an attempt to do it without enemies, and and in part, you know, I may have people I profoundly disagree with, and and uh, on, on especially in the political terrain. But uh, but I think also it's worth reading one's enemies, and, or, or not worth, worth its enemies, but worth reading the people that one disagrees with, so as not to uh, uh, think in terms of uh, friend and enemy in in the world of of scholarship either. So all that is to say. I know I'm going to piss off your delusions listening to this, uh, and and we're welcome to keep arguing, you know. And if you're recouping, but if you're recouping useful bits of Deleuze, great for you. But I'm going to say that their argument from authority no doesn't hold weight for me. And so the fact that Deleuze said something, just as you no, know, just like Derrida. I mean, I don't I don't want to bang on it, but like people think, you know, get their philosophy of language from Derrida instead of actually looking at contemporary linguistics, which which is amazing because most of Derrida's work is actually. Uh, 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 evidence, an attempt to repudiate um, all the uh, uh, contradictions that came out of Saussure's philosophy of language. Well, that Saussure's philosophy of language is over 100 years old. And Derrida, uh, uh, in that respect, preserves them, exactly as I was saying, in an attempt to cancel them out. But then people think that, oh, Derrida then proves that meaning is impossible and that language is always free play. No, it's just that actually, if you think, if you buy Derrida's reading of Saussure, then you would come to that conclusion. But A, uh, well, A, that wasn't a very accurate reading of Saussure, but in any case, we don't need to preserve Saussure. It's like a hundred year old dude. Like look at some other, look at some other more recent philosophy of language, and you'll see that actually many of the what what looks like contradictions in meaning and the free play of signs is just actually evidence that you're starting that we're starting from a bad philosophy of language. And so uh what we actually need to do is is build philosophy of language on different grounds. I'm giving a language examples here, but but let me be more specific. I have a chapter in the book uh, on philosophy of language, and I think um, part of um, their real insights in, in people like Derrida around the materiality of the sign and the notion of the trace and uh, and and uh, even what he uh, argues for um, the uh, the presence of the text before you know uh, architects and, and what have you. Um, but I think what a lot of that misses is that um, it, it is cap- many of the things that that whole philosophy of language took as truisms. Translation is impossible, they thought. Uh, words can never reference anything in the external world. To even try and reference is some kind of charlatanism. Uh, everything is always metaphors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A, a lot of that stuff just leads you to a point where you come to the conclusion that nothing can be said and that communication is impossible. And it's interesting because somebody's communicated that to you. Uh, or, or the other way to put it is, let me give you one specific example. All the arguments, uh, this is drawn from the book, all the arguments about 
how translation is impossible, get most of their mileage by providing translations. So if Derrida wants to convince you that uh, James Joyce is, un is untranslatable, he gives you a translation of Joyce to show you what you're missing. That is itself a translation and, and shows the undermining of the whole project. Or when um, Benjamin Worf was talking about the impossibility of standard European languages of communicating the knowledges of Cherokee, he communicates Cherokee in English. And it's, a, it's the same contradiction. And so in that respect, that should make us uh, uh, more skeptical or, you know, Quine, for those analytic philosophical readers uh, um, uh, who might be listening to your podcast, uh, his Gavagai problem uh, is, is uh, only a problem insofar as Quine him, himself refuses to commit to uh, whether it's talking about rabbit parts or rabbit. But once you know that it's one or the other, something is either a good translation or it's not, and there's much ambiguity. And it isn't to say that translation isn't fraught, hard, way more difficult than certain people might think. Translation turns out to be incredibly hard, but it doesn't turn out to be impossible. And so once you grant that, a whole bunch of other things open up and, and you'll see, um, you know, uh, you know, or the other version of that contra same contradiction is all the arguments about the death of the author that tra them, trace themselves to Roland Barthes and want to argue about what Roland Barthes really meant by the death of the mm -hmm. author. You've just you've just resurrected the author. And so uh, 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 and in that respect, proved the limitations of that whole argumentative structure. So um, all that is to say there are certain contradictions. And I think by um, working through them rather than retreating from them. Um, we can come out with a point that is neither a kind of naive universal language, let's say in the philosophy of language, an idea of mimetic representation between word and world in which, you know, uh, th this is the this is the position held by many people who advocated certain kinds of logic. You know, if we just, you know, the, this idea basically that everybody thought in like a... Um, a, a Cambridge Dawn and ordinary language philosophy, you know, or or and or and that if they, you know, or that if they did, you know, people who are who are trying to riff about language never having studied anything other than French or whatever, you know, I mean, like that kind of thing. Um, uh, so not that, not an, uh, an artificial notion of the universality of language or its transparency or the idea that everybody's basically thinking in what uh, people like Steven Pinker called mental ease. I think that's all not true. But instead, you get a sense of a diversity of different languages, but ones in which there are many different strategies for translation and comparison and, and interrelation. And so uh, often ones that are profoundly transformative. Uh, so and language that then turns out not to be a word for word translation. So you're not going to you might not have a single word for uh, English word for the Japanese wabi sabi, but you can write a long, you know, multi page thing that explains the concept of wabi sabi in English. I mean, mm -hmm. that's often translation turns out to be what's called additive rather than anything else. And so, um, and also then with the final, you know, return to this becoming, which as you see is central to this book as a whole, you never get a final translation because language is always changing. And so uh, uh, what you'll end up with is, you know, you always need to, and this is, you know, uh, an insight made by Derrida and Walter Benjamin and others, um, you know, you'll, you'll, there'll always need to be a new translation of Goethe into English because, you know, every time you translate Goethe into English, it'll date, the translation will itself be dated and, you know, the, the terms will get become archaic, et cetera. But, that problem with translating Goethe into English is the same problem that we ultimately have with Shakespeare in certain respects, or a definitely with thinkers older than Shakespeare. We always will need a new translation of Chaucer. So it's not the question of whether, you know, we're, it's, it's within a language or between languages. These are still acts of translation and shows us that meaning is constantly changing and that we need to figure out how to live in the horizon of becoming not merely with an investment in a fixed state of being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I recently spoke to um, Jay Garfield, who we sort of covered some yeah. of these topics. And I think this is probably one of the big important problems for this idea of metamodernism and this idea of canonization. And it's something you brought up, right, is that some of these ca alternative canons try to bring in these other thinkers and they're, they're always Western philosophers or they might be, uh, I don't know. Yeah, primarily Western philosophers. But when you move to the East, when you move to Africa, it's always like anthrop anthropological or it's maybe theological or it's religious. And basically the question would be is how do you remove that that sort of Western he hegemonic attitude towards basically anything else outside of its boundary where, where it comes to, well, okay, we're speaking about the, the self. You know, let's say you're – you 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 have a topic such as you're covering Kant and Hume's debate. Well, yeah. you know, as Jay Garfield would say, is why aren't we why aren't we speaking to the Buddhists, right? Who've been writing yeah. and talking about self for ages? I mean, how do you how do you see that leap being made? Yeah, so I mean, so I, I think you're right that there is that there's a long and you know. I mean, I know Jay Garfield, and, and I very much appreciate his work. Um, he's actually located not that, that far from me uh, in uh, Northampton, Mass. 
Um, and he's a, for those of you who didn't listen to that episode, he's a, a fairly famous um, translator of Buddhist philosophical thought into, uh, you know, in the Western philosophical idiom. Um, and he's been fighting an uphill battle for most of his life to do that. And, and in, in a respect, in a certain respect, um, there's a whole generation of scholars for which I feel a certain kind of debt because I was able to start getting Asian philosophical thought in undergraduate, even in even though it had been exiled to religion departments. So there, so there are two answers to this. And in and, and the first case, it's that um, many of the categories of thought that we so rigorously defend, for example, the boundary between philosophy and religion, I make arguments, and I have a whole chapter on this, that we need to shed and dissolve those categories. And in fact, one of the big insights uh, of the uh, uh, so-called postmodernism was a kind of, you know, what I call a kind of deconstructed dojo, where we learn how to knock down and destroy different kinds of conceptual artifacts. And we start to know the rhetorical force, for example, that goes in calling something a uh, philosophy and religion. Um, the end result isn't that we, you know, um, stop using words or something like that. I have an alternative response for how we should formulate different kinds of categories. But at the very least, we need to recognize that our categories cross cutting each other. So it's not a question of whether it is philosophy or religion, but rather, it, it, you know, it's it's often philosophy and religion, if we're going to use those English language terms to refer to them. And we're going to have to recognize that we're bringing a lot of baggage with both terms, which are not necessarily applicable outside of the European historical context. So one, one first thing that we need to do um, is to recognize that part of the way that philosophy defended itself, and the interesting thing is that Western philosophy wasn't always um, anti-Asian philosophical thought. For example, um, in the Enlightenment, in the, uh, often French thinkers were looking to China, for example. There's a whole period of chinoiserie, and many, and, and the Republic of Letters was often oriented toward Confucianism as a model in which, you know, you can, if you, if you read back through figures in the French Enlightenment, you might be surprised to see how uh, so many of them say positive things about China and Chinese thought, for example. Or, um, uh, but so uh, so it was there, uh, uh, and it, it actually persisted. The, one of the earliest um, large philosophical journals in the in America, for example, uh, was called the Monist, which I've written a little bit about because it, it connected with these Monist leagues, and it has this weird history uh, with new religious movements. But it um, also was an important site for the, for reading Asian philosophical thought in the early 20th century. So what you actually see is that there was a historical clamping down in the very period in which philosophy tried to differentiate itself from religion. And what happened was a lot of philosophy departments, the faculty were originally in religion departments uh, and theological departments, and its attempt to differentiate itself from theology, it also exiled a bunch of the world uh, into this realm of the category religion. And to call something a religion is often to relativize it, to say that, it, that it's irrelevant or it doesn't matter matter or that it's a matter of faith or et cetera, uh, at least when scholars do it. Um, so it, in that respect, communicating, some accusing somebody else of a kind of dogmatism or faith. So if you say, you know, science is his religion or whatever, you, you kind of mean that, that, that he's taking it too seriously or, or being too dogmatic. Or if you say that uh, the belief in ancestors is the religion of the Chinese or something, what you're saying is that you don't really believe in ancestors and you think that other people believe in them, but you think that other people do. All that is to say, the historical formation of categories of religion and philosophy have been both intersecting and separating in ways historically that are profoundly problematic. One of the things we need to do is recognize the Eurocentric blind spots that both were part of the inspiration for that and uh, uh, part of the product of that. And that having been done, we need this, you know, we can, I don't like this. Um, I think people like Garfield have been pioneering for bringing that thought um, into philosophy. We need a lot more work to do that. There need, it's not a it's not a foregone conclusion, um, but it is the case even here, uh, the philosophy department won't cross list my courses on Asian philosophy because uh, for, for various reasons, I don't wanna say it's necessarily racism, but let's say a certain kind of disciplinary uh, 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 blindedness uh, uh, that may have had racial histories to it. But um, all that is to say, there's a strong resistance to it, but I think we are working now to overcome it. And we can see that in, in works like even in the Metamodernism book, where I try and take that, much, that train of thought much more seriously. For people who are interested in this in more detail, my very first book, The Invention of Religion in Japan, looked at the categories of you know uh, religion and uh, a science, et cetera, in East Asia, and looked at their historical instantiation and how Japanese elites read them and interpreted them and what have you. There's now, at this particular moment, a lot of great world philosophy. And you could make the decision. There's this. There was an active debate, for example, in African philosophical thought uh, between two schools called the professional school. And I think the other one was called the, 
uh, uh, ethno-philosophical school. Um, and, you know, I'm now trying to remember something that I read, you know, uh, a, a little time, uh, some time ago. So I'm, I'll, I'll, but as I remember, the split is between, so ethnophilosophy was an attempt to look at the philosophy, anthropologically, basically, you know, look at the philosophy of, um, let's say, uh, uh, the Ghanaian, you know, Ghanaian philosophy, look at expressions, common Ghanaian sense expressions and ideas, and then try and mine them for philosophical lineage. The alternative response was something called the, um, the professional school, I associate it with figures like, uh, I think with Paul Utongi or something like that, but don't double check me on that because it's been a while. Um, but who uh, argued that basically, you know, it, it was less important what had happened in the past than people who were making the kind of global debate or providing philosophical resources to deal with the present. And uh, what I think you can, what, what I, I think both of those schools had something to them because, uh, and I think that there are third more recent attempts to reconcile the two of them, um, looking at philosophical resources and materials that don't flag themselves as philosophy, uh, but then making the case for their utility in larger, broader philosophical arguments. Um, and all that is to say, uh, I think that we have a lot of work to do at bringing in these non-European philosophical resources into the academy, uh, not just uh, uh, non-European, but also things that have been flagged as too religious to teach in philosophy departments, but often have, you know, really important things to say. And I think part of the first step to doing that is being able to um, uh, make the case for their arguments in non-authoritative grounds. So, you know, this is an argument not because uh, uh, a particular saint said it, but because uh, it, it, its argument makes sense. Um, yeah, all that is to say, I think we have a lot of work to do in that regard. And I think that part of one of the things that this book, the Metamodernism book, does to contribute to that work is on the first case to be very self-consciously an example of someone reading a ton of world philosophy with a lot of stuff in there and, and using a lot of those forces, sources and treating them not just as the subjects of thought, but as thinkers themselves. I, there's a lot of especially uh, in different chapters of the book where, where I do that and even more in the footnotes. Um, and then second, uh, uh, noting that in a way, uh, historicizing or provincializing conceptual categories like philosophy and religion themselves and showing how what blind spots they produce. And that should encourage us to no longer say, how have we used the term philosophy in the past, but how should we and could we be using the term philosophy in the future? Mm -hmm. So we don't just deconstruct it to note how terrible its history was, but also in order to liberate us from its past, at least as much as we can, and to and to repurpose it to do the kinds of work that we want that concept to do going forward. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and I think, you know, and Jay Garfield's work is a great place to read uh, some good stuff of, of, of particularly Buddhist philosophy. So for those of you who, who, who are interested in that, I definitely recommend his stuff quite highly. Um, and he does a good job of that, actually. He's been more successful than maybe he gives himself credit. Um, I don't know what he said in his interview with you, but he's, um, there's still a lot of resistance, but just as the old Ironically, just as the old guard uh, in Western, in the Anglo-American philosophy departments uh, are, um, are, they're fading and they're becoming more open to world philosophy. Uh, but uh, similarly, I find similar resistance from postmodernist philosophers who are similarly resistant to non-European philosophy. So, I mean, hmm. you know, it's, it's, the, it's that same, there's a generational shift happening. And I think um, um, that people like Garfield who are from that older generation are important for leading us kind of out and, uh, and into it, I think what I hope is a broader uh, world that no longer uh, so uh, so fixedly attaches to um, European versus non-European or more specifically, you know, defining things in terms of real philosophy, quote unquote, versus religion, quote unquote, which is usually the philosophy of the other. So um, all that is to say, I, I have some cautious optimism, but we have a lot of work to do to continue bringing world philosophy of different sorts to the academy at large. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, so we've got a couple of minutes here. I mean, is there anything you want to add about the book? And also, of course, wh where can we find it? Yeah, so let's see, do, anything else I wanted to add about the book? So um, I'm going to look at a note here to make sure I touch on things. So basically, what I do, so the book has basically um, five things that it does. And this is the same note as I looked at before, but I'll just keep going. Um, for those of you who are interested in the question of realism versus anti-realism, it makes a new intervention for why the realists versus anti-realists are usually talking past each other. For those of you who are, who are, um, who are uh, interested in the mechanics of deconstruction, it provides a deconstructive dojo that shows you how to disintegrate any category you want. And then instead of terminating that in uh, merely the abyss of, of, of skepticism, it uh, leads us through the abyss and out the other side towards some kind of process uh, oriented, what I call process social ontology and a notion of social kinds, where we look at how uh, languages, concepts, 
um, social structures continue to change and evolve, and that that has concrete implications for the kind of research we can do. It, it, it actually, it's Foucauldian genealogy turned on its head. For Foucault and company, the important thing was to look at moments of rupture, at discontinuity, at change. And you always wanted to show, if you're a good Foucauldian, how something was a false unity, and then you, you know, caused it to dissolve. Well, now we know that everything is false unities, that, that, that things are, are potentially, that everything has the potential to change and shift, that cultural difference is widespread, so instead of presuming continuity and then working to refute it in our genealogies, we presume discontinuity and heterogeneity. And then what becomes the problem to be explained is not cultural change, but cultural stability. And then, the, you know, or, or, or similarity rather than difference. We presume difference rather than presuming same similarity. And that produces a new notion that I try and argue for uh, uh, called social kinds and what we could do that to not merely reduce our scholarship to repeating the language of our uh, of, of other people that we're talking to. So we don't to say, you know, I'll call fish whatever my uh, informant, you know, the, the my anthropological subject calls a fish because, uh, you know, he may be referring to whales as fish or something, you know, or whatever. So there's, there's some work done there. Then um, I work from that um, into uh, from these disciplinary auto critiques of process, social ontology, social kinds. Then there's a the philosophy of language chapter. Then there's a, which we've talked about a little bit, but it's uh, about looking at connecting, naturalizing philosophy of language to think of humans um, as uh, on a continuum with other uh, sentient beings or, or let's say social animals and to look how, uh, you know, our communications are much more similar in certain respects to the calls of chimps and uh, the, the ant trails that we might want to uh, uh, have previously thought and how that is implications for a whole bunch of debates in, uh, in questions of translation, questions of meaning itself. Um, and questions about semiotics, how how um, things in the world come to mean certain things. And then finally, uh, the book ends with critical virtue ethics. So it's an attempt to put critical theory and virtue ethics together. Those are two well-established sub-discursive fields uh, in, 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 in philosophy, but they're rarely juxtaposed. And I, and I make a strong case for why uh, uh, those could be productively put together. So I think, um, I think, and then taken together, I want to call that um, metamodern theory. I, and again, what I'll say to your readers is that um, it is something that you're going to have to read probably more than once, uh, some of you, uh, if, if you want to get the most out of it. But, you know, um, where can you get it? Uh, it's uh, University of Chicago Press. Um, you can either order directly from the press's website or um, you can find it in large scale booksellers everywhere, including the behemoths like Amazon.com uh, and uh, uh, and other places or, you know, but or you get your local bookstore to order it or, or order directly from my publisher, uh, University of Chicago Press. Um, and but, you know, the yeah, so. All that is to say, uh, one of the other conclusions about the epistemology that I argue for and the ethics that I argue for is that both are rooted in a sense of compassion and the idea that one individual is not a single egotistical subject. And so I'm trying to produce a movement. It's a movement that doesn't already exist. One of the confusions that uh, I got for people who just looked at the cover of the book but didn't read it is they think I'm describing a pre-existing metamodernist movement. And mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you which novels are metamodernist and which philosophers get the metamodernist on no stamp of approval. And then, you know, and then as if that, you know, that's praise and then we go forward or something. That's not what I'm doing. I'm uh, with, with all full humility, at all, even in recognizing that it's an egotistical act, trying to make a paradigm shift, one that I think a lot of us. Uh, including James and, and others have long seen as overdue, whether my version of it will work or not, but at least I, I'm trying to lever us out of a kind of postmodernism without uh, falling back into a kind of modernism uh, that, that is the main presented alternative at this historical moment. Uh, and uh, for, for people who already know things like uh, affect theory, new materialism, et cetera, I write critiques of them that you might find interesting and useful, uh, even as, again, I try and build off of them in certain respects. Um, and then uh, I think hopefully this book will help us collectively, uh, if it's to be successful, move forward. Uh, and so if it's if it works, it'll inspire other people to do new kinds of work in, in uh, creative and generative ways. Uh, and if it doesn't, I'm on to the next book. I'm writing a book about power now. Uh, so uh, we'll we'll see basically, and I'll, I'll, I'll end with, uh, I'm not gonna be late for my next thing, but I'll just do it. Um, a, uh, uh, basically the other thing to note, and this was something that I started writing this book, but I didn't finish. Uh, in a huge number of humanities and social scientific disciplines, we keep saying that everything is about power. Mm -hmm. uh, it will tell you that language, 
terminates in power. Meaning is nothing but power. Ethics is all about power. Race is terminate is, is just about uh, a category produced by power. Uh, people even say, you know, gender relations are always power relations. Uh, capitalism is all about power. Uh, uh, even like sustainable agriculture books talk about how everything all comes down to power. Uh, throughout the academy, we keep terminating our theories and theories of power. The problem is our notion of power is often pretty vague, and we haven't really had a new theory of power since Foucault. Mm -hmm. And so, and in part two, we don't tend to, people tend to mash up Foucault with a bunch of other influences to make it kind of mushy, commonly presumed, but really deeply interrogated theory of power that we use background to most of the disciplines in the humanities and social sciences. I want to say that, that it's high time for our, our revisiting that theory of power and coming up with something new. And that's what I'm doing in the next book. Uh, so hopefully that'll take a little longer because that's when I'm starting now. Um, so uh, although I'm, I promised my editor again, I would write an sh even shorter book. So <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Uh, uh, but maybe uh, in a few years, uh, we'll be able to talk about that together again. And thank you all for listening. Uh, it was a real pleasure to be on the show as always. Uh, good to talk to you. Yeah, thanks very much, Jason.